Good morning. Good afternoon in New York. Oh, good afternoon, right. Yes, sorry. West Coast time. I know, I know. All right, so let's just get started and kick it off. Why was uh, the topic that you felt important to talk about in the framework of being enraged and engaged? Okay, that's a really, that gets right to it, which is I had a, a lot of friends who come to me and said, Zarin, you know, I, I read your writing or we've talked about this subject and I'm getting angry and I, and I wanted to know what you like think is the best way forward as angry as I am. And having been raised by somebody who taught me that my anger is not necessarily something to be afraid of, I have been always in a place where I've been not comfortable with rage, but I'm not afraid of being in, enraged at all, not at all times, but basically staying angry. So what I did was I've been telling my friends is we need your rage. We absolutely need you to stay enraged and engaged. The reason why I say the two together, and not just because it's a cute rhyme, but because that you kind of have to couple them together. The uh, the thing about rage is it motivates. It is something that you are not going to allow. Once you are enraged, you it's almost a, it's a, an inherent call to action. You feel in your body something has to change. You have a truth now that is beyond a reasonable and rational truth. You no longer have to get yourself there to make it make sense. It makes sense in the, in the pit of your soul. You, you know that this is wrong. And that, that awareness if you don't stay engaged, you will allow that light, that fire to be diminished by the fact that it is hot. But the thing about things like rage, I think fire is appropriate analogy for rage because fire is not good or bad, right? Fire is, it, it depends on what you do with it. So much like rage, fire can be something that is, uh, something that can light the way. It can be something that also can burn down a home. It, it Fire in and of itself is, it's not that it is inert, but it is valueless. We apply the value. So you can take your rage and use that as a motivating force. You can take your rage and use that as a destructive force. But rage in and of itself is not something we should be afraid of. It's something we should learn, much like with fire, to direct and to do the work that we want to do. So you can uh, tend to your community with fire. You can tend to your community with rage by saying, this is where I draw the line. This is not allowable. And there is a, a strength that comes from that. There is a passion that comes from that. And these are things that people often shy away from when they see it also bubbling up this rage I'm speaking of at the same time as destruction occurring. So people think, oh, I don't want there to be more and more of this. And that's not the matter. Rage doesn't necessarily mean destruction. Rage doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to get angrier and angrier to the point that your body feels like your skin is on fire. This is something that is more of a, of a cleansing by fire. It is something where you say to yourself and to the world this is not allowable and we need that we black people need everybody else to be as hurt by what they see as we are and that hurt to turn into anger and that anger to turn into rage and that rage to turn into action and that is a step now if people shy away from their rage in a sense we will have more work to do and they, and we've seen this people get angry and then that rage is it, it scares those who, I don't want to say the powers that be, but basically it scares those who feel they have something to lose. And they go, okay, how can we tamp down this rage? That's not the point. It is, well, let's address what the rage is being, uh, why people are enraged. What, what is promoting these feelings? And then start there. It's, it is kind of in a sense, I mean, this is a very base analogy, but you'll never clean up your room until you see the mess. So right now, people are upset, right? They're angry, but now that is hopefully going to motivate them to do something about it rather than to close their eyes. So uh, we need you to stay enraged because it's going to be a collective action. And I don't think that we're gonna get there through uh, the, the appeasement. We've tried, I mean, we, we've constantly tried. I mean, Colin Kaepernick's example of trying a peaceful protest and, and he was called a thug. And now we've seen it ratchet up, ratchet up. So if everybody can stay angry and not just be able for us to look to these symbols, the idea where people constantly talk about Martin Luther King, well, Martin Luther King was brilliant, a genius, and I'm glad that we still are talking about his legacy, but we can't constantly pin everything onto one person. We can't say that's the one model. Times change. And I do believe that if he were alive today, he would be enraged. So to suggest that he would be trying to quell the fires of anger is not appropriate because he was getting angrier and angrier in the, in the end of his own lifetime. So we see how this arc translates into a, a, a moral sense of imperative. And that, that's the key I find. And now also, obviously, 
you can pass through your rage back to love. That is the thing that I don't think people recognize is that anger is not a continuum where you're going to become uh, a toxic person, both for yourself and for your community. That rage can turn into an absolute undying love for your fellow person. As, as we were talking earlier, I have a problem with the American institutions. I wasn't necessarily somebody who was raised to always believe in, um, how do I best put it, that America had my best interests deep at heart and meant what it said on all of its uh, mottos. So in that awareness, I have, in a sense, always been uh, not disappointed, but expecting America to behave the way it does. So when people are getting enraged now, that is a new thing for me to see, is to see that these people are, also, the veil has dropped and people can see how absolutely terrible the behavior of our nation's law enforcement community is towards black people and other people of color. And we can't have that turn into something of, well, that's just a damn shame. It has to be, this is uh, intolerable. And part of intolerability is rage. So I, I, for one, am glad people are engaged and I want them to stay there and know that your anger People worry about how toxic, we know that stress kills. We know that it is very difficult to hold this much pain in your body. So that is part of uh, the communication necessity is that there is something called meaningful blackness. And uh, I was recently interviewing Dr. Rita Walker from Houston uh, and she, she studies depression, mental health, suicide in the black community. And she's found that for black Americans, there is a resilience we have. Black Americans are the least likely to kill them, kill ourselves. Now, it's striking that black people go, having gone through the American experience are the least likely to kill themselves. Why is that? Because of this connection to what she terms a meaningful blackness. And that meaningful blackness gives uh, a shared community a sense of a larger struggle. So you are one black person in a family of black people who are all trying to strive and survive together. If we can increase that feeling and make meaningful blackness into a meaningful Americanness, and, and for every American who, to, to have that same sense that black people have, that we are a community and we are, we are, our survival is dependent upon each other. If Americans could get to that, then that would be a feeling of love. And you get there through, this is intolerable the other way, by saying we went the other way and we can't go that way. Now we have to go the other way. So hopefully that, in, that level of anger can turn into engagement and can turn into community. So one, like, let's just take one step back. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who, who want to feel enraged or low key feel enraged and know there is something that is off or something that is wrong, but are struggling to like deal with the shame that comes with becoming a part of this fight and mm -hmm. this movement. And I, I see a lot and I know, I'm sure that you do too. A lot of people really defensive mm -hmm. about not understanding what's going on and then pinning their own opinions and answers to the reaction without understanding the history or the context. So what do people do with rage that they carry because they feel like they have a sense of empathy towards those who are oppressed, but just don't understand the accumulation of everything that's just happened? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in a sense, there, how do I best put it? There is a need for both anger and humility. So a person can be angry, but just because you are angry and because what you now recognize to be something that is possibly shameful in your eyes that you were unaware of this up to this point, and then thus you may now feel like, oh, I, I was part of the problem not to be aware of this. Those are all natural uh basically reactions that a person is going to have once they see that a problem is occurring is like, oh, I, I feel bad that I didn't know this. That's, that's a, that is a good place to start. But then you want to move through that, which then takes an education. If you are engaged, it means you actually are connected. It means you are showing up present. And if you're present, that means you are responding by constantly changing. You are, you're not going to, we're not looking to label people or to stick people into a new status. This is a dynamic. So it is basically welcome to the fight and now we can all move together so if anything shame you could that's a person i'm not gonna tell a person not to feel shame if they, but, but to process through that shame ask themselves why did you feel shame and then what could 
help remove that shame by telling yourself, I'm doing things. If you, uh, once again, going back to my facile clean room analogy, if you feel shame about the person you've been living as and you, you look around your environment, you're like, oh, I can't believe I've been living like this. It's not going to help you if you just focus on that feeling. You have to use that feeling to motivate you. So you say, okay, I've identified what I was doing. I no longer want to do that. Now, how do I move forward? And you can pr use that energy to propel yourself forward. It is, it is incumbent upon a person to be honest with yourself. So be uh, disappointed. But then now use that disappointment. If you do not want to feel that and stay there, use that to say, how can I be better? And then to talk to other people. And most importantly, to listen to other people. And even more importantly, is to do some of the reading before you go to talk to a person so that you ask questions that aren't just, can you tell me where to start? You know, like I think that there are assets out there that people can go to if they are earnest. So that way they can ask the second and third question as opposed to the first question of where do I start? I think people can find that on their own. We have lots of ways of finding information when people want to find it. So if you can find a restaurant's menu online, then you can find ways to consider how black people have been deprived of their humanity in America. This is not the difficult thing to find online. So do that. And then if you do that, that shows your engagement. That's what I mean by being engaged is showing up present saying this matters to me. I'm going to do my part because this is not my problem like I created it, but this is my problem like I want to fix it. So what can I do? And we can do this together. And to take that onus of this is my, I'm affected by this because I'm an American and this isn't right. And this is not the country that uh, I live in as far as I'm concerned, because everybody lives in, I mean, we have 300 million Americas we call one America, right? We have all of these, it's the American people, right? It is not the American institutions. It is our government because it is the American people. So we need to move in concert and to do that requires that we see each other, we hear each other, we respond to each other honestly, which occasionally means I'm going to have to apologize for something I did. And rather than to say, oh, I don't like how that feels, Try to, uh, I, I often tell my niece and nephew when they tell me about like a problem they're having in their life, we have a shorthand, which is to buffalo through something. On the plains, the buffalo, a great symbol of America, when they are confronted with a storm, they do not run from the storm. And this is why the buffalo has so much fur on the front of their body is that they charge towards the storm because they know if they go towards it, it will pass over them and that they will get through it faster. So I always tell them, do not be afraid of the thing that you don't want to deal with the sooner you deal with it the sooner you'll be on the other side where it is once again sunny wow. you will buffalo through that storm so that's what i want americans to do collectively is we now recognize the storming but rather than turn and hide or turn and run or bury ourselves or consider only our our personal interests we go how can we get the whole nation for that is by having the courage of our convictions and our rage can be part of our courage I love that analogy and I love that I can see that imagery. And I think that even with myself in like educating myself and learning, I have felt that, I mean, it's just like when you start learning a language or you start learning anything new, you, you, in the moments that it gets really hard, you remind yourself, I'm going to get to the end. Of, like there is an end to this, or there is a, a place that I can get to once I dedicate myself where I won't feel this way. You have to be okay with like feeling ignorant and feeling like the urge to learn so yeah. that you can alleviate that ignorance. So moving on to something that's a little bit more difficult and something that so many people, myself included, are dealing with right now is using your rage that we are carrying with everyone to engage in conversations with people who don't admit they're a part of the problem who are part of law enforcement, who don't feel, don't understand the quote destruction that is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And how do you maintain that rage in those conversations without pushing people away mm -hmm. and without hurting yourself as well? I think uh, as somebody who uh, has spent a lot of their time arguing in life, both as a journalist, making arguing for a point of truth, or in my personal life, I'm not willing, or I'm, I'm unwilling to just allow somebody to say, talk some nonsense at me and not say, well, I'm not going to necessarily say you're wrong, but I'm going to engage, which means in this case, I think that it's the same thing that I, I do when confronted on all sorts of issues. But an issue so important as this one is, do the thing that is the opposite of what you think, rather than the lecture question. So 
ask a pers person, draw out their truth so that they can see that their truth is not willing, it is, cannot hold the weight that they think it can. Say, okay, well, tell me more about this. Ask a question and then a ask another question, ask another question until their answers start to pile up and they can see it in a way that it's not really doing what they want or it's not saying what they want. Now you can both can look at that and say, why is that? Why is that not sufficing to explain this emotion you have? Because oftentimes people conflate emotion and reason and they come up with reasons to explain their emotions. So engage hmm. the questions until you can get to the emotion and then you can really have a conversation. And to do that takes a bit of, a bit of patience, but you can keep your calm when all, else, when all others are losing their heads by focusing on questions, by saying, I'm going to hear what this person has to say. I'm going to ask the question so that they hear what they have to say. And the two of you can move forward by focusing rather on you putting information into them, but drawing a truth out of them, which is the inverse, I think, of most people when they're really angry is to try to like tell a person why they're wrong. And I don't think that that really works because it makes a person be defensive. And I have family that we often argue about politics. And I found after years of debating with them that it is always through questions that I make the most advances in terms of their thinking. And we are also both honest in that moment. I'm not sitting there high on my horse telling them I know better. We're both trying to find the truth. We're standing there shoulder to shoulder as opposed to chest to chest Ooh. arguing. And we're looking wow. at the same problem together and going, what do we see? And that makes us partners. Even if we disagree, we are still positionally partners. And I think that that type of thinking is important. It sounds like a small thing, but someone is far more willing to listen to you if you're willing to consider something with them. And if you're willing to stand with them, as opposed to telling them that at the end of this, they have to be the loser. They have to be wrong. They have to be the person who was bad. Nobody wants to be that. So you are actually doing far more for them and for your yourself because you want to change them. The best way to do that is to be with them rather than to oppose them, if that makes sense. That makes incredible. That's actually one of the best pieces of advice that I've heard in a long time about engaging people in any conversation where there is a disagreement. Wow. So at what point, what is, I, I'm curious about your personal boundary, if you're okay with sharing, mm -hmm. what point is it not, you're like, this conversation isn't worth it anymore? Okay. Uh, I have this happen often. People come to me, they say, I need you to tell me why I'm not doing right in America. I need you to tell me, uh, like what, yesterday I had somebody send me their phone number and say, can you call me so we could, would you be willing to talk to a stranger? I have so many questions. I need you to like, and I, I wanted to say, have you tried any of this work on your own? Like, so my boundary is a lack of engagement. If you're not willing to show up and be present with me, I can't be present with you because then I'm, I'm teaching you as, as some reluctant student. And that's not the relationship I want to engage with a person. I want to engage with them as a peer. I don't want to try to stand here and act like, oh, I'm just going to tell you what to do and you're going to go off and do it. That's not, that's not the equality I'm looking for. I want us to reach this together, which means you have to show up and have thought about it. You have to have questions you're willing to entertain and positions you're willing to change. It cannot be that you just want me to tell you what to do. That will not change the world in a way that I find important. So my one, I'd say, boundary is you got to be willing to show up and be present. That's incredible. Yes. I mean, very obvious now that you say it, but yes. Um, all right, so you, and I wrote this down because you mentioned when we were talking about this topic that as a black person, you have learned to hold rage yep. and emphasizing on the importance of people who are not black sharing it with you and using that to light the way and to overcome. Mm -hmm. What can you teach us about holding rage and the importance of doing so shoulder to shoulder? Okay, so uh, there is the very famous James Bald Baldwin quote, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage all the time. Now, what Baldwin was describing is the conditions of America are enraging. So for black people, we live in a world where we're told our humanity is less than, our lives are not protected, and that everything that everyone says about America doesn't really apply to us, and everybody kind of knows that. That is a weird, dehumanized place to be. In, in being raised in that, I have always identified with everybody because I view the world in a, an aggressive sense as my people. Everybody is my people. So when I see someone 
being wronged in public, I get enraged, but I don't run over and try to impose what I think should happen. I get enraged and then I engage to see if they're okay, if I can help them. I ask questions. I don't run in and think that the primacy of my rage means anything. I only use it as uh, a, a, an indicator for myself that this matters. I use it as like a, a, not a little voice, but a loud voice inside of me saying something has to be done. And then I go over and I ask what can be done? How can I help? And I don't just impose, okay, I'm coming over here, I'm gonna save things. So I think that it's not unfair to ask people to do exactly that, which is to listen long enough to yourself that your rage becomes a, a, a barometer you can trust, a, an, an internal voice, and then to use that to tell yourself to act. And then when to, you go to act, it is through engagement, which means you come upon a situation, you assess it, and you say to yourself through questions, what can I do to help? Who here is being hurt? What would be the most helpful thing for me to do rather than to tell yourself you know what's going on because there is also a, a, an arrogance of that that gets in the way that anger can be belligerent and we know that and that's why people are often worried about anger is it is irrational but you can make your anger rational if you are un, if you are unafraid of it if you make it this uh charging horse you know people are worried about a charging horse because of the power of it but you can run very fast on a charging horse we can take something that is scary and turn it into something positive if we are unafraid to do that but that means you have to acknowledge that your rage is a good thing and a, and a light that is and is showing you the way and a way to connect so all i ask for people to do is to show up and to be unafraid of their rage and it will pass through you and form a community of connection you will be present in that moment because your rage is about somebody else. Or if your rage is about yourself, hopefully somebody else comes to you, sees that and holds it with you. And by holding it with you, it lessens it for both of you because yeah. you are not alone then. So now your rage is a bond and not a divide. So I would hope that people recognize that rage is a numerous multivalent tool. It can be lots of things, but first and foremost, it can be a bond if you share it and you use it as something that we are both enraged right now because what we are seeing is a wrong that we don't need to argue about, that we don't need to explicate how wrong it is. We can just say it is wrong. And now we can move to the next and more important question, what are we going to do about it? As, to just, as opposed to how wrong is it? I think sometimes we spend a little bit of time talking about the, uh, the I don't want to say the measure or the gradient of wrong, but basically having conversations that are spinning wheels. And I want people to be constantly treating things like an emergency, which is you don't then ask how fast was the car traveling that went off the road and hit the tree to decide what you're gonna do. You go and you concentrate on the people who are in the car accident. Then you can go back and do that other stuff later. So I want to people to engage and then to do that by asking questions so we can be moving forward. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for your time. I. Um... I didn't tell you I wanted to ask this, but yes. how can we support you and how can we support your work? Oh, uh, well, I write primarily these days for Mel Magazine and Mel does an amazing coverage and they've been doing amazing coverage right now of both the culture and the culture online. So I would recommend following Mel. Uh, that's M-E-L, Mel Magazine. And then also uh, anytime that you see somebody pleading for engagement do what you can to spread that and not in a way that you're like basically be the finger pointing at the moon and constantly think about how can i make other people see the grandeur and make other people be on my team and think about how can i enlarge what we're doing as opposed to being right don't worry about so much about being right as being effective and being connected and being present think about these things not in terms of how it feels for you but how you're moving into a world you want to inhabit. Be a gardener and not somebody fighting in a jungle. You, you're, you're out here with all the metaphors. Well, Thank you, know, I do what you I can. so much, Zarin. Of course. Thank you for having me. I love it. So keep doing the work you do. That also is really important. Thank you. you. Really I appreciate smart allies like you. <laughs> I appreciate you so much. I will talk to you soon. And thank you again. I'm going to save this and share it so that people can come back to this. And thanks for adding another resource of ed education. Cool. Hang in there. Bye. Stay safe. That was Zaren Burnett. You can get his Instagram is down there, but he is a lot more active on Twitter. His Twitter is amazing. And he writes for Mel Magazine, 
you can go to the Mel Magazine archive of all of his articles. He has, the, actually the piece that I found him through was called A Gentleman's Guide to Rape Culture. I think that was on Medium and I found him, I found that years ago and um, it was just absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for tuning in. We will be doing this every day this week, except for Wednesday where I'm going to be dropping a new episode of The Process and I will see you tomorrow, 12 p.m. Um, this full episode will actually be posted on AYS's profile. And I just want to say thank you for staying um, engaged and enraged. And I hope that this inspired you to continue having those hard conversations that you all have been having. All right. Have a great day.